World War I came along. My dad time he was back in Stoughton and he volunteered. I, others told me he was the first to uh, take and volunteer in the uh, town of Stoughton. In 1927, uh, my daddy and another World War I fellow bought a Waco 10, GXE Waco, that had the OX-5 engine in it. And uh, I can remember my daddy strapping me uh, in the front seat of that thing in a bell I couldn't even see out. And in the Waco, I kind of grew up in that. And then pretty soon, of course, I could see out. Pretty soon I was flying it. And then on my 14th birthday, which was June 9, 1935, my daddy sold it in that airplane and went in Attleboro, Massachusetts. was a grass field where he kept the airplane. My name is Forrest Wharton Bird. I was born in Stoughton, Massachusetts on June 9, 1921. Probably from the time I was maybe 12 on, I wanted to fly an airplane. I started in aviation. I guess I'm the only one that did. And what I le learned in aviation, Bernoullian theory and Newtonian laws and so on, I applied that to the heart and lungs. 50 million some odd people with these obstructive pulmonary diseases. Bronchitis among the worst. Well, my obligation is preventing that from going. So if I can maintain the bronchial circulation, they're not going to die of that, they're going to die of something else. That's what I've been able to do. I still don't classify myself as an inventor. I never looked at that. You see a need and you take and correct it. My daddy, first of all, he taught me the, the principles behind something, the mathematics, the physics. He involved me in everything. He was a great teacher and showed me a way of life, I guess, more than anything else. But he did teach me to use my head and my hands. And my dad had a great machine shop, and I learned to build things, and he would help me. He was a great daddy. He really was. I was always working in the machine shop because remember I first started on automotive. I guess my first thing I did pretty much alone, he guided me a little bit, was homemade tractors out of Model T Fords. And I had orders to bring a captured JU-88, which was a German bomber that had been modified to high altitude. And I had orders to take it back to Wright Pat. Uh, I got fascinated out of ways, you know, it's boring as hell going across hour after hour. They had a little round box down there, it says demand regulator, and it had a big tube coming up and a face mask on it. The only thing, you had to suck your guts out to release the oxygen to you. And I figured, Jesus, I'm an engineer, I can do a hell of a lot better than that. I swiped the one out of the back seat, put in my B4 and took it back to, uh, they never missed it back there at Wright Pat. But anyhow, I took it back and I started to work on it. But I made a real good demand regulator. In other words, you could just effortless and it didn't chatter or anything, it chattered at first. But anyhow, I got it and I was real proud of it. And Dr. Armstrong ran the School of Aviation and Medicine, and he had a bottle of oxygen brought in and so on and hooked it up. And while I'm talking to these other two fellows, just casually, and he breathed on it, and he said, Strange, well, this is nothing but a demand regulator. And, oh, Christ, my heart went down. But he says, a damn good one. I <laughs> go, wow. They used to take and give grants to the various medical schools to do different things. So I became part of the grants. That's how they got me into medical school. I got to a formal medical three years, which worked out very, very well. Otherwise, I would have never had it. And then, as I say, after I had that, uh, then I first developed what was called a Mark 7 respirator, which became standard. It would breed for the smallest baby, the largest adult. But if I hadn't had the military background, I could not have done it. Medevac, it was like an ambulance. And that was, that was a traveling bed, really, that was all you had. Now, that game, that was intensive care transport right off the bat. I was kind of looking at it in World War II. It wasn't, uh, we, we had Medevac, but still it was flying beds. A little more than flying beds, but not too much. You know, the time of injury until we get them into attendance all the way through makes the difference whether they live or die. And boy, did we ever learn that in Vietnam. And they were had about an 80% mortality because these guys would get hit in the chest and injuries and so on. So if you didn't tie off the bleeders and you didn't ventilate them, of course, they bleed to death. A lot of them bled to death or they just couldn't breathe. And we got over there and we decided, well, gee, Medivac should be more, it should be intensive care transport. So I was sent over to Cameron Bay. We got over there and we taught the corpsmen to tie off the bleeders and ventilate them and put them on the choppers. And they said probably within three months we had it down to 20%, but so they within six months we had it down to that. The mortality rate among wounded is the lowest in history. 
I think I felt pretty probably as good as ever when we developed the baby bird. And we, you see, we had probably a 70% mortality, and in two years we had it down probably under 10%, or very much reduced. Everything I build is pneumatic. I have no wires, no batteries or anything else. And of course, that's where aviation came in. Everything I do is Bernoulli and the Newtonian physics. Everything I have done. But that has enabled me to do that, and that came out of aviation. But you know, you start looking at the lung, and you look at air flows across the wings and so on, and in resistances, inhalation and exhalation, boy, there's a tremendous crossover there. There really is. But I think the motivation was doing something that worked. And you know, I think innately we all want to serve each other in different ways, and that's a good way to do it. And everything was a challenge. My whole life's been a challenge. But you have to have confidence in what you're doing, and you better feel good about it. Life is fate, time, and circumstance.